Our next speaker is uh, Vincentian Priest. He lives in Fibsborough. He's most famous for being the founder of the Intercession for Priests back in 1976. And he's written an excellent book called I Will Come Myself. And a funny story, I had a, an experience about two, three years ago when a priest in Southampton asked me to go and speak for Divine Mercy Sunday. And the following year, he couldn't get a speaker anyway, anywhere. And he rang me up again and he said, uh, he said, Don, he said, can you get a speaker to come to Southampton for Divine Mercy Sunday? And I tried round and people were saying, no, 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 too far and take up too much time. So he rang me back anyway and he says, any luck? And I said, no, Father Joe, I'm sorry. I said, I just can't get anybody for you. And beside my bed locker at home was Father Kevin's book. And I just said to him, I said, I will come myself. <laughs> so it always has fond memories for me. So without further ado, please put your hands together for Father Kevin Scallon. Good afternoon, everyone. Are you happy? Yes. You soon put a stop to that, I think. <laughs> we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Lord, we come together in your presence at this conference, which is celebrating your divine mercy and the experience of your merciful love and the forgiveness of our sins. Help us now, Lord, with the grace of your Holy Spirit. Mary, Mother of Jesus, refuge of sinners, pray for us. And this is a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, Sister Bridget and I gave a parish retreat in Louisiana. And the first day, the theme of the first day of our retreats is always the, day, the theme of forgiveness and repentance. And uh, just as I was going into the church, a little lady said to me, Father, are you going to talk about sin tonight? Because, you know, she said, you priests don't talk about sin anymore. You talk about forgiveness and love and feeling good and all of that, but you don't ever talk about sin. I didn't know what to say to her. But I know that, in a certain sense, she was right. Because in many instances now today, and now today, it's very politically incorrect to speak about sin. Because as you know, in the secular world, sin has virtually been abolished. And no, no one... Um, um, admits to that anymore. Nobody really acknowledges their sin. But we know, brothers and sisters, that when Jesus appeared, as I just read to you from the uh, Gospel of John, at the, to the disciples on the first day of the week, which was Easter Sunday, it's no, it's no coincidence that the first thing that he talked to them about as part of their mission was the forgiveness of sins. And when you think of that, and when you think of the first words of John the Baptist and Jesus 
as they began their public ministry, you realize that, you know, sin, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here he is now in this, in the very hours after his resurrection, reminding the apostles that the first fruit of his passion, death, and resurrection was and is the forgiveness of sins. And see, the church has always remembered that, even though we may have forgotten it. Because every time we gather together as faithful people of God to celebrate any of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, the first thing that happens is that we are called to remember our sins and ask forgiveness. And that has been the, the mission of the church from that day to this. Today, people are, are, have lost touch with this virtue of repentance, because it is a virtue. And they, Jesus has taken care of, of us and giving us the Holy Eucharist, and we all acknowledge that. But, you know, Jesus is also present as a forgiving and loving and healing Christ uh, in this beautiful sacrament of reconciliation. People are losing their faith. And when you lose faith, you lose hope. And when you lose hope, you stop loving. And when you stop loving, you lose mercy itself. The, the truth is that sin is a, a, sin is a grim reality of the lives of each and every one of us. God has given us the commandments and the gospels showing us how, what to believe and how we should act. And the worship of God, as we know, is most perfectly expressed uh, uh, through Jesus in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. You know, there's a prayer in the church, in the sacrament of reconciliation, where we say, the priest says, after he has given us absolution, he says, may the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary and all the saints, may whatever good you do and suffering you endure, heal your sins, help you to grow in holiness, and reward you with eternal life. So those two ideas struck me very much very recently. There are two, uh, two major graces that come to us through this beautiful sacrament of reconciliation. And the first is, of course, the forgiveness of sins and the healing of our sins. And the second is growing in holiness. And this prayer that I just mentioned tells us that. First, forgiveness and healing. Second, growth and holiness. In the letter, in the, in the diary of, of uh, St. Faustina, Jesus speaks to her, and it's there in reference uh, number 1448. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Where Jesus says... To Faustina, speak of my mercy. Tell souls where they are to look for solace. That is, in the tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of reconciliation. There the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. To avail oneself of this miracle, it is not necessary to go on a long, great pilgrimage to carry out some external ceremony. It suffices to come with faith to the feet of my representative, the priest, and to reveal to him one's misery. And the miracle of divine mercy will be fully demonstrated. Oh, how miserable are those who do not take advantage of the miracle of God's mercy. You will call out in vain, but it will be too late. Well, just, you know, to, 
to think of our sins for a moment. The sins are they're all very familiar to us. Forgetting about God, forgetting about the worship of God, which we required to in, in, the, in the participation in the Holy Eucharist every Sunday, uh, respect for marriage and human life and children, and of course, human life involves many things, and you know you're familiar with them all, wars and murder and other things. The sins also involve the holiness of marriage and the God-given orientation of human sexuality. Sins involve truth, especially God's truth, as we hear it in the sacred scriptures, in the Bible, and in the and the authentic teaching of the church. Sin involves others, of course, respect and care for others especially, fidelity in marriage, faithfulness to the church and to the authority of the church, and, of course, our baptism ob obligates us all to live a life of holiness and repentance. So that's, that's our sins. All of us, most of us here, you know, are people who don't sin a lot. You know, we don't. And so that more or less is taken care of in our lives. But we still need to go to confession, of course. But, and we need to reveal, you know, there is a custom growing in now. I've recently heard confessions somewhere, you know, and the people came in and they said to me, uh, Father, I'm sorry for all the sins of my past life. Well, that's an act of contrition, you know, a short one, but very good. But I was inclined to ask them, well, what, what ones in particular? And they couldn't, they wouldn't tell me. They said, well, I'm sorry for all the sins of my past life. And that, that's all right as far as it goes, you know. But what we need to do is we need to reveal to Christ, who is present to us, at that moment in that sacrament, we need to reveal and put a name on our sins and don't be covering it up with vague psychological terms or other kind of language, you know. A man saying, you know, I lost my temper with my neighbor. When he, what, what he means to say is, you know, I broke his arm and fractured his skull. You know. That, I think, deserves to be mentioned as well as, I'm sorry for all the sins of my life, past life, you know. And the same, you know, so I was very friendly with a woman who was my neighbor down the street. What he didn't tell us that he committed no adultery with her, you know. You know what I mean? That we, we, we have, have everywhere nowadays, you know, you're not meant to speak directly. You're meant to speak in vague generalities. You know. That's not what confession's about, you know. And I'm not suggesting that you would go into, uh, Sister B. always tells the story about somebody who came to her and... <laughs> And said to her, oh, now, Sister Breeze, it all started with the assassination of President Kennedy. You know. <laughs> we don't want you doing that today. Just go to confession, and there's not much time these, these poor men here, and myself also will be hearing confessions. And we do want to hear, you know, your personal history. We just want to hear your sins. That'll be enough for the day. Later on, we can deal with your personal history. And there is, as you know, of course, a great denial of, of, of sin today. And we see this very, very much manifested in the public life of our nation. But the other thing, brothers and sisters, you know, that's, that's dealing with our sins. But this, this, this other aspect, you know, of growth and holiness. Now, growth and holiness mostly doesn't involve sinful things. Just bad things, bad habits, bad attitudes, and many other things like that. You know, but not, and and people generally are con, are content to confess just their sins. You know, you know, there's a long history in the church of certainly some of the saints, all of the saints, I suppose, really. Like for example, Saint Vincent de Paul, and I think John Paul, the Saint John Paul the Second, you know would go to confession every day. Not because they needed to confess their sins or that they were big sinners, you know, 
but they were they they went because they were discontented with things that they were that were going on in their life. And I'm going to read a long list here of things, and you'll recognize. I haven't time because we're restricted by time at the moment, but I'd like to just read the this list for you. Uh, and this this these things pertain to growth and holiness. In other words, they're the things that we have to eliminate from our lives if we want to become saints. And that's what we all want to become, isn't it? We all want to become saints. So, what are they? Well, take take pride, for example, the first thing. Pride is the commonest uh, imperfection that most people have. And under the pride comes self-sufficiency, arrogance, vanity, sensuality, oversensitivity, laziness, indolence, ambition, uh, ambition to cut a good figure and push yourself forward, as showing off, lying, refusal to admit false, obstinacy, impatience, anxiety, harsh words, judging, and lack of compassion. I recognize all those in myself. Not as bad as I used to be, but I'm still pretty bad, you know. And then there's, coming under that also, is sensuality, and negligence, sloth, laziness, daydreaming, weakness, discouragement, jealousy, and envy, resistance to grace and goodness. I know about that too, most of those. And that's the struggle, you know, part of the struggle that goes on with us. And then the things pertaining to our intellect, proneness to evil, frivolity that refuses to take responsibility and take things seriously, quick to judge, severe with others, but not with yourself, superficial and narrow, the attitude which says, everyone is wrong except me. I know these are all words, brothers and sisters, but you recognize them. We recognize them as part of us. And of course, the antidote to those kind of uh, habits is humility, modesty, gratitude to God, seeing the good in others. And then our will, of course, weakness of will, acting by fits and starts yielding to evil influences and to vanity, to stubbornness, obstinate, with a closed, close to goodness, intemperate and unreliable. And the antidote to those, of course, are the virtues that open us to the gifts of others. We see the gifts of others and appreciate them and do not begrudge or envy. Do not begrudge or envy. And then, of course, there's the, the, um, the imagination going over old hearts. Oh, my God. You know, some, somebody said something to me 40 years ago. And I forgave him at the time, you know. But I still get mad when I think of it. Honestly. I still get mad when I think about it. And I have to forgive him all over again. And that's, you know... Um, and people, some people love... They love old... They love going over old things. You... Do you remember what she said to me? I remember. And that's not good. Not good. Anger. Same thing going over all of you know, Indulging in your anger. Loving to be angry. And some people are like that, you know. We're all like that. We, we, we do that, you know. And sadness and melancholy and exaggeration of things and living in a kind of a fanciful, 
unreality of life. The imagination runs away with you. And sometimes that can interfere with you know, the practical things of human life. And the antidote to all of that, of course, is the healing of memories. My memory of that man 40 years ago needs to be, still needs to be healed. Still needs to be healed. And I'm praying for that every day. And for the anger that went with it, that goes with it. And the indignation that goes with it. So the healing of memories and living in the real world. We live in a real world where people are not what you think they ought to be or what you think they should be. People are just not perfect, you know. And what have we got to do with that? One thing, you have to love the person. You have to love them whether they're agreeable or disagreeable. If they're agreeable, it's easier. If they're disagreeable, it's not as easy. But see, you know what I'm saying? Like that, this is where, this is the difference between, you know, saints and just ordinary folk like me. You know, St. Francis passed the leper on the road and Jesus said to him, go back and embrace him and kiss him. Francis didn't want to do that, you know. But he did it. He did it. He showed love for this poor, afflicted human being. A love which only Christ can put into our hearts. And then, of course, learn to laugh. Learn to laugh. Took me years. Took me years to learn to laugh at myself first and then with others, not much at them, but with them. And then the, the, the other things that, are, uh, that we do as well, like being obtuse and hard-hearted. That's a, that's a terrible thing to, to, in, to encounter, somebody who is just, you know, cold and unforgiving and totally negative and ungracious who makes a tragedy out of everything and allowing emotions to become extreme and indiscreet in their demands acting like spoiled children for many instances so we think of these things and we ask the Lord in his goodness to forgive us. And so we'll say these prayers now and then the priests will go, and I'd like them to go now exactly, to go to your places to, to um, celebrate the sacrament with you. And this litany of mercy now, let us pray that, Lord, we have sinned against you, the only true God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we have sinned against you, the holiness of your name. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive us for not worshipping you as you have commanded. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we have failed as parents and children. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive us our anger and make us gentle and humble of heart like you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, heal my turbulent sexuality and forgive my sinful indulgence, Lord of mercy. Lord, forgive my sinful desires for material things, Lord have mercy. And heal my fondness for gossip and exaggeration, Lord have mercy. And now we turn to our merciful Father, praying for forgiveness and protection from evil in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us. And beloved, now we acknowledge our sins and cry for forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned 
and your thoughts and my words and what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers, and pray for me to the Lord. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, you do not abandon the sinner, but seek the lost with mercy and love. Look upon your crucified Son and the price he paid for our salvation. Free us from our many sins, and by your grace help us to sin no more. We ask this through Christ our Lord. May the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now all of us priests will... earlier um, try to be succinct. God bless you. Now if the stewards would, uh, would bring the priests just to their positions and if they put in place two chairs for them. <laughs> 